Well, welcome everybody. Glad you're joining in with us, whether you're at one of our campuses or if you're watching this online, we're so glad you're here. And if you're just joining us or if you've been away for a few weeks, uh, we're right in the middle of a series where we are covering the entire Bible in just eight weeks. And I want to catch you up to where we're at in the story uh, so you'll know where we're at and I may have to talk kind of fast, but here goes. We've been learning that the Bible, well, it isn't actually a book. And I know that sounds weird to some of you. Uh, but it's actually a collection of books. It's a collection of 66 books with over around 40 different authors over a period of about 2,000 years. But we've been learning that even though all of that's true, the Bible really tells just one story. God is telling one story throughout all of history, and that story can be summed up in basically one word. And we learned that word in week one is the word redemption. And you know this already, that, that word simply means to buy something back, to regain possession of something. And so we said that God's story really is a story about God's desire or his plan to reclaim what is his most prized possession, and that is us, human beings. And so we're tracking the whole arc of the story, the whole Bible, by looking at eight different Bible characters that sort of represent uh, the, the storyline. So far, here's what we've talked about. We talked about first, Adam. And how God made human beings and how those human beings, even though they were God's prized creation, they rebelled against God. And it's been that way ever since. And so because God was determined to not give up on his creation, he came to a man named Abraham. And through Abraham, God says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. It's going to show the world that I'm the one true God. And, and I'm going to rescue every single person who will follow me through that one nation and he he set Abraham up through one son to create this nation and then uh, it went throughout history and then we learned about a guy named Moses and God used Moses to come in and rescue that nation when they had gotten off track and they had been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years and and Moses set the people up showed them how to live as God's people uh, and gave them rules to live by and then last week Ed talked to us about this famous king of Israel named David David was this great king he led God's people probably to the to heights that they'd never seen. He, he got them refocused on loving God, how to follow his plan for the nation. But we didn't get to this part of the story last week, but David had some problems. In fact, uh, David did some great things, but by the end of David's life, David didn't end so well. In fact, there were some disputes among his family and some mistakes that David made. And because of those disputes and because of that conflict, there was conflict in the nation. And some of you may not know this, but God's nation actually split in two kind of like our nation did, in the north and the south. And, and in the north, northern kingdom, they retained the nation name. They, they retained the name Israel. But then there was the southern kingdom, and they, they took on the name of, of the, the nation of Judah. And so you had two, two kingdoms side by side, both a part of God's people. And, and if you've been reading your Bible and you've sort of read this part of the story before, you may have noticed that the Bible talks about kings and how there will be a king of Israel and there will be a king of Judah. And that's what's going on here, the two different kingdoms. And you may also have noticed, if you read this part of the Bible, that as the Bible describes these kings and their reigns and their rule, it'll, it, there's sort of a theme that just keeps popping up. And you'll see this phrase. It'll say something like this. King so-and-so reigned this long over Judah or over Israel, and whether it's the northern or the southern kingdom. But that king, it will, it will say, did evil in the eyes of the Lord. It's sort of a recurring theme in God's story. Usually what that's talking about is has something to do with the king turning the nation away from worshiping God or maybe turning them towards some other form of worship or maybe even none at all. And God sees all of this. He sees what's happening to his, his nation, how it's split and how it's moving in the, in the wrong direction. They for, they're starting to forget who he is. They're starting to run after all these false gods or these pagan ways of doing life. They've turned away from God's law, his protection for their life. And in this period of time that we're actually going to focus on today in today's talk, God begins a, a new process. God begins to send a series of prophets, men and women, who speak on behalf of God, and he begins to warn his people about the direction that they're taking, to let them know you're off track, and, and, and God's trying to win them back, to come back to him. Now, eventually, God allows some, some consequences to come because of that. God allows the Assyrian army, they, they actually come in and they overtake the northern kingdom. They come into the nation of Israel, the northern part, and the Assyrians... They, they pretty much destroy the place. They take off thousands of, of Israelites and, and, and into captivity. And, and it's a horrible time for the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, here's what you would think. 
You would think that after seeing that happen to their brothers in the north, that the, that the guys in the south would think to themselves, you know, we probably should wise up. These prophets keep telling us to, to change our ways. To, they keep warning us to shape up or the same thing's going to happen to us. Maybe we ought to listen. Maybe we ought to change some of the things that we're doing. But they don't. They just continue to ignore these prophets over and over again. And so finally you come to the year about 600 B.C., which is about 100 years after the northern kingdom is overtaken by the Assyrians. And then the nation of Babylon invades the south. And they have a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And so he marches in and he pretty much takes over. And he begins uh, to rule over the southern kingdom, the nation of Judah at this point. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't want to spend a whole lot of time and a lot of effort on these folks that he just captured. So he decides, he comes up with a plan. He says, I'm going to choose a king to rule over you and be sort of my representative instead of me. And see, he's, he figures it's a better idea to bring somebody out from the nation, a, a, an Israelite to rule over them. And so he, he sets up a king and he says, now listen, do things the way I tell you. Rule as if you were me. Follow my rules, follow my guidelines, and nobody gets hurt. If you just listen to me and you, you just keep the peace and send your taxes and, 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 and just keep things stable, then I'll be happy and nothing will happen and we'll get along fine. Now you would think again that these kings would, would listen, but they don't. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he just he has king after king, and they won't listen. They won't, they won't toe the line, so to speak. And so he finally just gets frustrated. He says, I'm going to give you one last chance. And he comes down into, into Judah, and he sets up one last king. And he says, this is the guy. Follow me. Do what I tell you to do, and we'll be okay. But if not, serious consequences are going to come home to you. And this king's name, that, this final king that Nebuchadnezzar sets up, his name is Zedekiah. Now, this is the guy we're going to look at today in our God Story series, which a lot of you, if you were going to put the top eight characters in the Bible you thought we were going to study, I guarantee you Zedekiah was not on your short list. But that's who we're going to look at today. So if you've got a Bible, I encourage you to open it up to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. If you don't have a real Bible, then all you got to do is get on your smartphone, uh, open up the CCC app, and you just click the Bible button, and it magically appears right there on your smartphone. But that's where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible or a smartphone, it'll be on the screen. 2 Chronicles is where we're going to be reading chapter 36, starting with verse 11. Here's the story. It says, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There's that theme again. And he did not humble himself before Jeremiah, the prophet, who spoke the word of the Lord. Now, again, as I've been telling you, Zedekiah is really just, seems like he's just one in a long line of kings who just don't want to seem to toe the line. And, and this time, he's rebelling against the guy who put him there, Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't do things the way Nebuchadnezzar wanted him to do. And not only that, he wouldn't even listen to God's instructions uh, through a prophet that God sent named Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the guy that God had used in this period of history to speak to his nation. So Jeremiah, he's on the scene, and he keeps trying to convince Zedekiah, turn the nation back to God. We're off track. Come on. And Zedekiah, again, he'll have nothing to do with it. Because see, in Zedekiah's mind, he doesn't need God. He's, he's, he's a pretty strong guy. He, he thinks, I don't need God. I can handle this on my own. He thinks he's a strong, capable kind of king, and he can rule the nation just fine. But if you just read the story, which you should read your Bible, it's a fascinating story. Jeremiah is the most persistent guy you will ever meet. I mean, he just keeps, he keeps coming on back to, to, to Zedekiah, and he keeps begging him and begging. He comes up with all these creative kind of ways to get his point across, and, and he keeps preaching and keeps preaching, and Zedekiah, again, will have nothing of it. So finally, Zedekiah is like, I'm fed up with this guy. He won't shut up. So he takes uh, Jeremiah, and he, he arrests him. He, he uh, ties him up, and he puts him in the middle of the courtyard sort of as, a, as an example to the nation. But again, Jeremiah, he's just persistent. He won't stop preaching. So everybody that walks through the courtyard, he's yelling at him. He's preaching at him. Zedekiah comes in. He's yelling at him. He just won't stop talking. So finally, Zedekiah's had enough. He says, all right, this will shut him up. He takes Jeremiah, and he rests him, and he, and he throws him down the bottom of this deep well. Now, again, Jeremiah, being the persistent guy he is, 
he doesn't stop. In fact, he keeps preaching from the bottom of this well. It's like anybody who walks by the well. Jeremiah's yelling at him, turn back to God. And he doesn't even know if anybody's up there. He just keeps talking. He's yelling at people who walk past the well. But despite all of this preaching, all of this talk, Zedekiah just won't have any of it. Now Zedekiah is in complete rebellion against God and, as we're about to see, against Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 13. He also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him take an oath in God's name. He became stiff-necked. He hardened his heart. He would not turn to the Lord, the God of Israel. And furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful following all the detestable practices of the nations around them. They defiled the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. Now, there's a real important part of that scripture I want to point out to you, and it's this. There's a phrase that I want you to see. I want you to notice why it is that God sends messengers to warn his people. It says, he, it was because he had what on them? He had pity on them. That's important. And also notice how God continues over and over to refer to the Israelites. Whose people are they? They're his. They're still his people. See, here's the point I'm making. Even in the midst of all this rebellion, their unwillingness to listen to his warnings, God still says, you are still my people. Remember, I made you a promise, God would say, and I'm the God who always keeps his promises. And even if you won't acknowledge me, even if you won't listen to the warnings that I'm trying to tell you what's coming in the future and you're headed in the wrong direction, you're still my people, and I'm still going to be faithful to you. Look at verse 16. But they mocked God's messengers. They despised his words. They scoffed at his prophets until... The wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people, and there was no remedy. Those are sobering words. But let me just kind of point this back and sort of apply it to us today. And, and I don't want you to raise your hands on this or anything, but I just want you to think about it. How many of you would have to admit, if you're honest, there has been a period of time in your life where you knew what God wanted you to do. You knew that you weren't headed in the right direction, and, and you knew exactly what it would take to get back on the right path. You knew what God wanted you to do, you, and you heard his instructions. You heard warnings about what, the way you were headed, and you simply just said, I hear you, but God, I think I got this. God, I don't, I don't think I need to do that. I don't think I need to stop that. I don't think I need to change that. God, I think I've got this. See, I'm confident that almost everybody listening to me today, if you're honest, you would say some of the dumbest decisions you ever made, some of the worst calls, some of the worst direction you ever took in your life was because you knew and you heard and you, down deep, you knew exactly what God was calling you to do, what God was asking you to stop or asking you to do. And you just said, God... I get it, but I just, I don't need it right now. God, I think I got this. God, God, I can handle it. I, I, I'm on it. Some of you, if you're just real honest, you would say, not only have you been in a period of life like that, you're in one right now. You, you come to places like this Sunday after Sunday, and, and here's what you're doing. You're, you're hearing it, and you know what's right. And you're practically taking God's words of warning and throwing them down a well so you don't have to hear it anymore. So you don't have to face it anymore. And here's what I want you to notice if that's you or if that has been you. In verses 15 and 16, the Bible introduces us to a new facet of God's personality. And this is one that we haven't looked at yet in this series, but it's one that's important. It's not fun, but we have to look at it. We're learning now that there is a time and there is a place that we can go to and there is no more remedy for us. God has sent all the warnings he's going to send. God has sent all the sermons that's going to be preached. God has sent all the friends that are going to give you advice. And the time, is of that, time for that is done. 
And the only thing left for God to do with some of us at, at certain points in our lives is he just has to let us go. Let you continue to go your way. Let you continue to rebel and face the consequences of the decisions that you're making. See, some of you have been sitting here for weeks. Some of you for months. Some of you for years. And every week you, you hear the same thing over and over again. And it, 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 to be honest, it kind of gets old to you. You hear God's word. And it's clear to you. God says, in that relationship, get out of that business deal. You know that's not right. Hey, come on, fix your marriage. It's time. It's time to face that. Get help for that addiction or that problem that you're facing. Come on, let go of the anger. It's not helping you. It's hurting people. Come clean about that sin that's so secret that you're afraid to let out. And over and over and over again, you say, thanks, God, but no thanks. I got this. I'll do it my way. And listen, I don't take any satisfaction in saying this to you, but for some of you, right now, God is saying, look, look because I love you, and because I want so much for you to turn back to me, the only thing that I can do for you is to let you go. The best thing that can happen for you right now is for me to just let you go on your way and face the consequences. God says, too far, too long, too much. That's it. The only way you're going to listen is if the consequences for your choices come to bear in your life. And I, and I hate to say this, but for some of you, I'm betting you might just be weeks away. Some of you could very well even be days away from the consequences of your choices to hit your life. And that's why you need so desperately, we all need to hear this story of what happens to King Zedekiah. In fact, I want you to look at the rest of his story. We're going to pick it up in, in another part in the Bible, in Jeremiah chapter 52. We'll start with verse 4. It says, In the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, marched against Jerusalem with his whole army. They camped outside the city and built siege works all around it. The city was kept under siege until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. And by the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine in the city had become so severe that there was no food for the people to eat. Now, get this picture in your mind. The entire Babylonian army, one of the most powerful armies in the world at that time, they surround the entire city of Jerusalem. Nobody goes in, nobody goes out, and they just wait. And the whole time, everybody's inside wondering, are they going to come in? Are they going to attack us? Are we done for? But they wait. And they wait for two years until all the resources just dry up. And the whole time, Zedekiah and all of his people, just they just begin to slowly wither away. They begin to starve to death. Now, what's more interesting is what Zedekiah does next. When he realizes that this is the situation that he's gotten himself into, Zedekiah... He comes to one of his servants one day and says, hey, whatever happened to that guy that used to yell so much? Whatever happened to Jeremiah? And they're saying, well, well, your, your highness, you threw him down the well. <laughs> you wanted him to shut up. He said, well, go get him. Bring him back. I want to talk to him. And so that's what Zedekiah does. Look at Jeremiah chapter 21. Here's Zedekiah's words to Jeremiah. He says, inquire now the Lord for us, because Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, is attacking us. Perhaps the Lord will perform wonders for us, as in times past, so that they will withdraw from us. See, it's now that Zedekiah remembers all the great things that he'd heard God had done for his people in the past. And now it's kind of like he's thinking, well, we need to get in on some of that. And, and, and he's going back to the, all the old stories that he grew up hearing about how God parted the Red Sea and brought his people out of, out of Egypt and out of slavery and how he did all the plagues. And Zedekiah is thinking, hey, Jeremiah, tell God to do some of that cool stuff again. Tell, tell God to get us out of this situation. And, and here's what you'll notice about what Zedekiah doesn't say. He doesn't repent. He doesn't say he's sorry. He doesn't admit any wrong. He just wants out. He doesn't want to change himself. He just wants to change the circumstances. He wants to manage the outcome, which is what we all often want to do when we're in situations like this. Now that his consequences have come home, and all the decisions that he's making, he begins to cry out, God, rescue me. And you know, a lot of us would think, well, 
Isn't God graceful, gracious? Isn't God a God of mercy? Won't he just come running? But you know what God's answer was through prophet, the prophet Jeremiah? In fact, if you go through this story and you read the account, in, in a nutshell, here's what God says to Zedekiah through Jeremiah. He says, look, Zedekiah, I, I've already told you already. I've given you the warnings. I told you you've gone too far. Here's your only option. He says, the best thing you can do right now, Zedekiah, is just lay down, give up, surrender. You're surrounded. There's not much I can do for you at this point. You just need to wave the white flag. Let the Babylonians come in and you surrender because the day of mercy and the day of grace is over for you. The only option I've given you now is surrender. And, and here's the promise, God says. He says, if you'll surrender right here and right now, everybody gets to walk away with their lives. You'll be okay. But you just got to surrender. But it's too late for you to escape this. And I'm going to allow these consequences to come because I already told you they would. But God says, I'm not doing this to pay you back. I'm doing this because I want to win you back. But I know because of the condition your heart is in right now, Zedekiah, the only thing that will work to win you back is if this happens, these consequences. Zedekiah can't do it. He hears all of that and he says, Okay, if that's my only option, then I'm taking the other one. And he won't surrender. He can't give in to God. Even now, he just can't. He just, his pride or whatever just won't let him. Watch what happens, Jeremiah 52, 7. Then the city wall was broken through, and the whole army fled. They left the city at night through the gate between the two walls near the king's garden, though the Babylonians were surrounding the city. They fled toward the Arabah, but the Babylonian army pursued King Zedekiah. They overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his soldiers were separated from him, and they scattered, and he was captured. He was taken to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced a sentence on him. There at Riblah, the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He also killed all the officials of Judah. And then, and this is graphic, he put out Zedekiah's eyes. He bound him with bronze shackles, took him to Babylon, where he put him in prison till the day of his death. Can you imagine the pain? Can you imagine the regret that Zedekiah must have felt as he sat in that prison cell day after day after day for the rest of his life having the last image that he ever saw before his eyes were literally plucked out of his head. The last image he saw was the death of his sons and the destruction of everything that he cared about. But, and this is a terrifying truth, but it's a, I believe, a wonderful truth about God. And it's one that we don't like to talk about much, and we don't like to think about it much, but it's, it's still the truth. And it's the truth I believe God shows us, and the way it applies to us, I think, is this. God would say to you and me, as much as I love my people, as much as I love you, and as much as I've done to raise up this great nation, God would say, as much as I've gone through to deliver this nation, I will go to whatever lengths are necessary. I will even allow you to suffer some of the worst of consequences. If that's the only thing that will wake you up and eventually win you back to a relationship with me, I will do it. In fact, let me show you just how serious God is about this. Look at Second Chronicles 36. We'll start with verse 19. This is what God allowed to happen to this nation. Think about it. This is the nation that God has spent generations building up, generations revealing himself to this nation. And here's what happens. Verse 19, they set fire to God's temple. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces. They destroyed everything of value there. They carried off into exile to Babylon a remnant who escaped from the sword. And they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word that the Lord had spoken through Jeremiah. See, here's the part of the story that we haven't heard yet. See, while all this rebellion's going on and all these warnings are happening, God is still speaking to Jeremiah. 
And God promises Jeremiah, he says, after all this is over, Jeremiah, after all the destruction, after all the consequences come down, just remember, there's going to be a small group left, a small remnant of people, and they will have learned their lesson, and their hearts are going to turn back to me, and, and, and their affections are going to come back to me. And God says, it's going to last for about 70 years. But after that time is over, I'm a covenant-keeping God. I always keep my promises. I'll bring you back. I'll eventually bring all the promises that I've made to fruition for all of my people for all of these generations. And, and if you read the rest of the story, it, it, it's, it's pretty much a miracle when you think about it, when you read it. In light of everything that, that happens in this story, during this 70-year period, Nebuchadnezzar, he's reigning over these captured, this small group of captured Israelites. But finally, his reign comes to an end, and, and the whole Babylonian Empire falls. They're actually taken over by the Persians. And after 70 years, just like God said, God begins to move. In fact, look what happens. This is, this is pretty amazing when you think about it. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord that he had spoken to Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. And any one of his people who are left among you, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. That's amazing. This is a pagan king. He knows nothing about God. He has no, he's not even an Israelite. He's not one of God's people. And God moves in his heart, not only to, to allow his people, the Israelites, to go back to their land, but to let them rebuild everything that they lost, their city, their temple, their nation. I mean, you just keep reading through this story, the rest of the account. There's a guy named Zerubbabel, which is easy for me to say, but he goes back with them, and he actually rebuilds the temple right there in Jerusalem that they had lost. A prophet rises up later. His name is Ezra, and he begins to speak God's word again to the people that they had lost over the years. He begins to rebuild their spiritual heritage, and they start to come back. There's an extraordinary story. You should read it sometime. There's a guy named Nehemiah. He comes on the scene, and he begins... He goes back into Jerusalem. He rebuilds the walls around the city so that they're safe and they're, they're protected again. He, he gets another pagan king to actually pay for it and give him the materials. It's, it's an extraordinary story that out of all of these ashes and out of all of this destruction, God keeps his promise. He brings his people right back to where they were. And, and, it, and it is an amazing story. But the important thing we have to see out of this is the lesson in it for us. And please, whatever you do, don't miss this. God is a loving Father. But because God is a loving Father, He disciplines His children. And see, the reason God disciplines us is not because He's, he's trying to pay us back. God disciplines us to win us back. And I know that's hard for a lot of us to accept, and it's hard to hear. But sometimes, God in his wisdom, he knows, because he's God. He knows that the only thing sometimes that will ever bring his kids home, that will ever win his kids back, is to let them face consequences of the actions that they continue to take. In fact, I want you to look at these words. These are from the newer part of the Bible. And this, this is God's, uh, th this first one, it's God's words. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke, and I discipline. In another place in the book of Hebrews, it says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful. Of course it is. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's God. You know, when I was growing up, I, I lived in a, a downtown kind of neighborhood in, in a little town where, you know, it doesn't happen often these days, but as kids growing up, we, we rode our bikes all up and down the streets. I mean, we, I rode my bike to school. I, I rode to the store. I mean, we, we were, if the sun was out, man, we were out riding our bikes. That was just the thing that we did. And I remember in this little neighborhood, you know, to have a cool bike was the thing. And I, all I ever wanted was this, just this one, you know, really cool BMX bike. And I begged my parents for it. And finally, one Christmas, I got one. And it was the coolest bike I'd ever seen in my life. It was 
chrome on the frame. It had these nice yellow plastic mag wheels and blue rubber on the tires. I mean, it would look so probably cheesy today, but I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. And I got that bike, and I rode that bike everywhere. I loved that bike. It was nut. If you had looked at my life at that time, I, my life revolved around that bike. I mean, that just it was everything to me. It was the most prized possession I'd ever had to that point, and I and I loved that thing. Now, one day I was out riding my bike, and I was I was on the sidewalk, speeding down the sidewalk, I was going down this hill, just and I was following the rules like I was supposed to. But all of a sudden, I decided it would be fun to go off into the street, jump the curb, go to the other side of the other sidewalk on the other side and jump that curb. I just thought that would be fun. And so I just decided I'd do it. And so I did. I never looked behind me, but there was a car actually coming down the street and I never saw it, but I heard it. It hit brakes, squall tires and came to a stop. And luckily it never, it didn't hit me. But unluckily, my mom was outside and she saw the whole thing. And in that moment, in my mind, I kind of had hoped that I would have to deal with the car rather than have to go home and deal with my mom. But here's the thing. Over the course of months with that bike, my mom had seen a transformation happen in me. I, I'd gotten a little bit cocky. I'd gotten a little bit independent. and I'd gotten a little bit loose with the rules. And I felt like I could handle it. And I didn't have to follow the guidelines to, that were put in place to keep me safe. And so I had just gotten a little uh, off track and she knew it she had seen it and that was where I was at that point in my life it and that bike was everything to me I mean if you take that bike away from me I mean, I was like taking away the most important piece of my life now I say all that to ask you this question do you think for a moment that my parents on that day loving me the way they did and their great parents do you think they ever hesitated for one second to take away the most precious thing in my life in order to bring me back to a place of safety and sanity? Do you think they thought twice about taking that bike away from me? <laughs> of course not. I sat in that house for weeks begging to ride that bike after that day. If you're a parent, think about it. If you saw something that you knew was jeopardizing your child's life, jeopardizing their well-being, jeopardizing their safety. Even if it was the most precious thing to them or to you, would you even hesitate for a second to sacrifice the thing in order to win your child back? Of course you wouldn't. And here's my point. If God would not spare the life of his own son in order to secure a relationship with you, what makes you think he won't spare your health your wealth, your relationships, or any other thing in your life to get your attention. If God would not even spare his son to gain your salvation, what makes me think that he's going to spare anything else in my life to gain my affection and my attention? See, that's the terrifying but yet wonderful truth about God. God is a jealous God. And if he knows the only way to get my attention is take away my toys, take away my things, take away something that I love, he will not hesitate. Because there is nothing to God so precious in my life that it is worth standing in the way of my relationship with him. Is God patient? Sure he is. Will God give you warnings? Of course he will. Isn't he merciful? Absolutely. But there is a day when patience and warnings will end. There is a time when discipline is the only thing that will wake us up. So for just a moment, can I just can I just kind of be like Jeremiah in your life? Maybe you've never had anybody be that for you before. And can I just say to you that God loves you. He's a loving dad. He's, he's crazy about you. And he wants more than anything else to be in a relationship with you. But if you continue to say to God over and over again, God, I got this. God, I don't need you. God, I'm okay. You keep ignoring the pleas and the warnings and even the people that he sends into your life to call you back to him. At some point, God will have no choice but to let you go. And when he lets you go, trust me, consequences and discipline will hit your life. For some of you, you've heard warning after warning after warning. 
Come on, come clean about your past. Let go of that relationship. You know it's wrong. Stop damaging your kids. Stop hurting your family. Don't take that deal. You know better than that. Get a grip on your finances. Stop feeding that habit. You've heard it over and over again. And here's the thing some of you just need to hear today. When that discipline comes, and, and trust me, it eventually will, and those consequences hit your life, it's going to affect you in more ways than you can imagine. It will affect your family. It will affect your marriage, maybe your business, your finances, your relationships. If, if you're in a, per, a person who has influence or authority, it will affect everybody underneath your influence and authority. Now, that's the bad news. But the good news is this. You can avoid the discipline of God. But the only way for you to avoid God's discipline is to surrender to God's will. That's it. He's a loving father, and, and he says to you, look, wherever you are, whatever you've done, wh however far you've gone, even if you're right in the middle of it, if you're in the middle of the pain, if you're in the middle of the consequences that are bearing on your life right now, God says, I'll still take you back. If you just turn around, I'll put the pieces of your life back together. It might not happen tomorrow. It might take a while. It, it'll be a long road, but we can start right here, right now. Today, if, if that's where you are and, and you're thinking, man, I... I need to do that. I'm ready to do that. I want to encourage you to do one thing for me before you leave today. I want you to take your connection card, and I want you to check the box on the back that says, look, I am ready to surrender to God. I'm ready to make the changes that he's calling me to make in my life. It's right there on the left side. That could be your decision between you and God. You just sort of seal that. When you do this, the Bible has a word for it. It's called repentance. And that simply just means that you change, you turn around, you, you, you turn away from sin, and you turn toward God. Whatever it is he's calling you to do, that's what that is. I want to challenge you to do that today. And, and listen, if it's your very first time to ever do anything like this, or even if it's not, my challenge is to you, you need to tell somebody about it, especially if this is your first time ever making this decision. So I'm going to encourage you to tell a friend. If you don't have a friend to tell, Take your card out to the lobby as you leave today and give it to your campus pastor and just let him know. And he'll pray for you. He'll encourage you. He'll help you take your next steps. But for others of you, this is sort of a reminder to you. You look back on your life and you would say, you know what? <laughs> I was in that place and I, I had the discipline of God hit my life and the consequences came to bear and it brought me back to God. Here's your next step. And you can check this on your connection card too. You need to spend the next seven days just saying, God, thanks for your discipline. And I know that sounds weird to thank God for his discipline, but for those of you who've been through it, you know. It was the one thing, it was the only thing that brought you to a place of sanity, and it brought you back to a relationship with God, and you need to thank God. God, thank you for loving me so much that you wouldn't spare anything, even your own son, to bring me back to a relationship with you. And you can just live in that this week, thanking God for who he is. Now, if you would, let's just bow our heads, and I want to pray for you. And God, as tough as it may be to say, we thank you that you're a God who disciplines us. Because God, if you didn't, well, then you wouldn't be a loving God. God, we know that your love requires this. And so God, whether we be on the front end of this or maybe going through it or on, on, the, on looking back on it, God, we thank you that you love us so much that you would not spare anything to continue and to bring us into relationship with you. God, thank you for this story, for this, this character in your, in your story that we learned from today. And I pray for those who may be hearing from you right now something that needs to change, something that needs to, 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 to happen in, in their life. God, that more than anything, we would just say yes to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.